We told you that we would um, be upfront with you and uh, you know, communicate what's going on with the pastor search. And if there are candidates who are coming to preach, then we would let you know about it so that, uh, so that you're aware of kind of what's going on. And so I just want to be you know, absolutely clear and put your mind at ease. Um, I am not a candidate. <laughs> um, just, just want to be clear on that so you don't need to go to the elders and say, what in the world are you guys thinking? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just filling in. Um, one thing I want to make sure that we do this week is I want to make sure that we uh, pray for Roland. And he called me last night and asked me to share that with you. He's doing a, a conference for folks who are men and women who are coming from all over the country to be equipped to go out um, in the mission field and to train other leaders in foreign countries, uh, other Christian leaders. And so it's a big deal. They've got a lot of people coming in. Roland's got a lot on his plate. Um, he's been praying for this uh, like crazy. And just want to ask you to commit uh, every day this week, if you would, to pray for what's going on um, with that. And it will make an impact in the world. Uh, we are wrapping up uh, a series, which we've called New Beginnings. Uh, we've been talking about how do we have a fresh start in, uh, in 2012. And, you know, as I look at it, Roland talked about building a foundation in 2012 on God's grace, not on anything that we do, but purely and wholly on the grace of God. John last week uh, gave a great message about uh, discipleship, being a disciple, and making disciples that we would follow Jesus, that we would be uh, conformed to Jesus, and that we would take Jesus' mess mission out into the world to bring the hope of Christ to our dying world. And as a result, there are more than 400 names on the board over here that we have committed to pray for and to communicate with and to love and to, uh, to focus on, on helping these people come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's exciting to me. What do you guys think? Amen. So, because of what I do, I get asked financial questions a lot. And people want to know about the economy. They say, you know, what do you think? You know, we're coming into a new year. And this is happening more this year than any year I can remember. People saying, what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to turn around? Is the economy going to turn around? Is it going to, going to be better this year? Or are we going to slip back into recession? And the answer is, I really have no idea. You know, God knows the future. We don't. But it occurred to me that we could each ask the same question of ourselves in our own spiritual life. In 2012, will you turn things around? Will you have a fresh start? Will your relationship with God be new in 2012? Or will you slip into a spiritual recession? And you know, as I look at this group, I, I just, I, I know that with a group this large, there are some of you who will have a wonderfully fresh and new walk with God in 2012. And there are others who won't. There are others who will slide into a spiritual recession and you will have a wasted year. And if you string a few of those wasted years back to back, it leads to a wasted life. And so I want to talk this morning about those two options about how, what that looks like practically in our life. What makes the difference between spiritual recession and spiritual renewal? I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians 3, starting at verse 17. And we're going to camp on this verse, uh, on this passage of Scripture today, and uh, we're just going to unpack this a little bit. It says this, Brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about life here on earth. We'll stop there. Let's pray. Father, we know that your word is powerful. It can just slice us in two. And, Lord, we know that without you, we can't even understand the things in your word. We don't have any spiritual comprehension 
beyond your Holy Spirit's ability to, to open our minds. And so, Father, as we approach your scripture, I pray that you would open the minds of everyone here, that you would illuminate your scripture to us, that you would teach us the things that you want us to know. Father, we also pray for Roland and for Patricia this week as they're involved in, in kingdom activity. Lord, that is, uh, th will make a difference around the world. And we pray for strength. We know that the enemy is attacking. We know that Satan does not want what's going on um, on this campus the rest of this week. And so, Father, we pray uh, that you would protect, uh, that you would strengthen Roland, that you would protect all of the people who are here, uh, keep them from distractions, help, them, help their minds be clear. May your word be proclaimed, Lord, and may Roland's um, just use his giftedness in training these leaders to be able to go out and multiply leaders around the world. Father, we give you this morning. We want you to change our lives. We open ourselves up to that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would take out your outline that you'll find in your, uh, your bulletin, it's an insert there, and um, you can take some notes, and that'll kind of help you follow along as we begin to unpack this passage and see what Paul is saying in uh, Philippians 3. You know, he starts out, Paul starts out by saying, follow my example. Now, is Paul being arrogant there? He's saying, you know, hey, I am so great that you guys all just ought to be like me. I mean, we've all met people like that, right? He's like, can't you just do it like I do it? You know, can't you just be more like me? Yeah. Uh, and that is not at all what Paul is saying. You know, he does start in, uh, in verse 5, he does start with his pedigree. And it's an impressive one. He talks about uh, his lineage. He talks about his upbringing. He talks about all the incredible things that he did. He talked about how he kept every point in the law as well as anybody that there was, how he was perfectly qualified to be a religious leader of Israel. But then what Paul does is in verse 7, he says he throws all of that in the garbage. It's worthless. It means nothing to him. He just forgets all of that and puts it in the past. That's not what he wants us to follow. Okay? Verse 10, Paul says the only thing that matters is knowing Christ. Knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, following and walking with Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. In verse 12 and 13, he's humble. He says, you know, I haven't arrived yet. I, I'm pressing on. I'm, I'm, I'm moving towards Christ. I have this goal out there to be like Christ. But believe me, I, am, I have not arrived there yet. I blow it just like everybody else. And, um, you know, that's encouraging, isn't it? You know, question, does Tom Brady want to complete every pass that he throws today? Yes. Yeah. Will Tom Brady complete every pass? Yes. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. But that's a picture of how we are. When he throws an incomplete pass, does he get discouraged and say, I'm, just, I'm not doing this anymore, you know? He forgets what lies behind. He presses forward to what lies ahead. He only is looking forward because if that quarterback starts dwelling on the failures of the past, the interception he just threw, the incomplete pass he just threw, it's going to mess with what he's doing in the future. And Paul is saying the same thing. I'm forgetting what lies behind. I'm pressing forward. I know I'm not perfect. I'll never be perfect here on this earth. I'll never be everything that God has for me here on this earth. And yet I am going to press on towards that. And that is the example that Paul says that he wants us to follow. The example of, of being humble. The example of being realistic. Of coming clean every day. Of confessing sin. Of our brokenness and our failures and yet striving to be like Christ. Spiritually mature people, you know, what you know that spiritually immature people don't know is that the most important thing in 2012 is following Jesus, loving Jesus, knowing Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying here. So he says, this is my lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of striving to be like Christ, striving to draw closer to him. Um, and Paul says, there is one thing. I press on for this one thing. 
What is that one thing? It's church, and if you're in church, then Jesus. you don't know the answer. You go with <laughs> Jesus. So what is that one thing that Paul is after more than anything else? Like with a little more enthusiasm, like Jesus. Christ. Okay. <laughs> it's knowing Jesus. Let me ask you, who are you following that wants to be like Jesus? Who is your Paul? Paul says, follow my example. Who is your Paul? Who is your example? Who do you have in your life who walks humbly with Jesus, knows Jesus intimately, loves Jesus deeply? Who is that person? And flip the other side of that coin, to whom are you being an example of someone who walks humbly with Christ and loves him deeply and knows him intimately? Who are you following? And who is looking to your example? Well, Paul goes on from that, and he wants to contrast two different lifestyles. Okay? He's got a wasted lifestyle that leads to spiritual recession, contrasted with a renewed lifestyle, leads to spiritual renewal, leads to a new start, a fresh start. And, you know, you get a choice. So which do you want? Now, I know we're in church, right? And so it's an obvious answer. But really, what do you want? Because a spiritual recession, a wasted life, comes from just cruising. It comes from just going through the motions. Show up at church on Sunday, leave, and then just go have the rest of the day. And, and just, you know, just not follow Christ. I don't need to read his word. I don't need to spend time with him daily. Um, you know, I don't, I don't need to do any of those things, I'm just, you know, I'm forgiven and I'm just going gonna to cruise. And that is what leads to a wasted life, a spiritual recession. Life of a believer is hard, you know? A spiritual renewal doesn't happen all by itself. We come to Christ and we say, you know, we need to be, have, live a courageous lifestyle. We need to come to God and say, God, you, know, you tell me what to do. God, I will trust you with my money. How hard is that? God, I will trust you with my marriage. I'll trust you with my kids. I will look at your word every day. I will follow your values. I will live according to your truth. I will live a courageous life of desperate dependence. I will follow you. That's hard. If anybody tells you the Christian life is easy, they have no idea what the Christian life is all about. They really don't. And Paul's going to say that there's a choice. And he's going to talk about these people who have chosen to not build this strong inner life and to walk the way of spiritual recession. And he's going to talk about the consequences of that. So what does a wasted life look like? Here's the question from the passage. What makes Paul cry? And Paul wrote most of the New Testament. This is the only place that Paul says, this makes me cry. Let me read it again. I've told you before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, and I do not think that this is a literary device. I think Paul is sitting in jail writing this letter to the Philippian church, and he's thinking about these people who he will later say have chosen destruction. And he's crying as he writes this. With tears in my eyes, there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameless things, and they only think about life here on earth. So what makes Paul cry? It's a wasted life. And here it is, three marks of a wasted life. And you can see these on your outline. They are first letting your spiritual life or your inner life erode. Secondly, that leads to being seduced by worldly passions and then forgetting your final destination. So we're going to talk about each of those three this morning. 
and unpack a little bit more about what that looks like. The first thing, eroding your spiritual life, your inner life, is simply neglecting it. It's saying, Jesus loves me. I'm forgiven. I don't have to read my Bible. I don't have to connect with him. I don't need to spend time in his word asking him to show me what to do. You know, I don't need to learn to trust him. I don't need to take courageous steps of faith. Um, I don't need to know how to deal with darkness and, and evil in my life. I'm forgiven, right? Woo! <laughs> and that's how it goes. And you all know people like that, don't you? Their attitude is, hey, God forgave me. So I'll just go live my life. I'll just do what I'm doing. I'm going to cruise. I'm just going to let life happen. You know, a wise person once told me, he said, spiritual maturity is not built in a day, but spiritual maturity is built daily. I thought that was really helpful for me. Um, if you are not committed to some kind of daily walk with Jesus, your inner life will erode. It just will. And you will end up on this road that, path, that Paul is talking about that leads towards destruction, that leads towards a wasted life if you do not connect with God every day. It's just that important. And you say, you know, daily connecting with God, that, that's hard. I mean, that takes time. You don't understand. I mean, I'm busy. I've got a lot of stuff going on. I'm running a business. I've got a, you know, I've got a household just full of kids. I've got all of these things going. I am busy. And Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you rest. Why does he say that? Because we need it. We need it, right? And I've got to tell you, no slight if, if any of you are fishermen, but, you know, these fishermen 2,000 years ago hanging out by the Sea of Galilee, you know, cast their nets, hanging out, you know, if those guys needed to enter into Jesus' rest, how much more do we in our busy, crazy lives? And just because you're busy doesn't mean that anything that you're doing is really important, right? I mean, think about it. Is the stuff you're doing, is the world going to stop turning if you, don't, if, if, if you don't just stay on the treadmill? And if you are just going fast and hard and busy all the time, guess what? You don't connect with people. You don't meet people's needs. You don't have time to hear from God about what he wants you to do. Um, you know, you don't have time to refresh your soul if you're that busy. So time with God is a critical, critical thing. You know, there was a study that was done, and uh, they looked at people where the doc their doctor told them, if you don't change your behavior, you're going to die. Okay? How many people do you think change their behavior? One out of nine. A little bit better than 10%. You know, you're going to die. Eh, Big Mac, I'm going to die. You know, uh, one out of 10 or one out of nine, slightly better than 10%, change their behavior when faced with death. So this is hard stuff. This is not easy. But you've got to understand that's exactly what Paul is saying here, that if you don't connect with God and build a deep and a strong inner life daily, you're going to head down that path towards a wasted life. And he talks about death and destruction here. And I'm hoping that we do better than one out of nine in our, our little cozy group here, okay? I want to challenge you guys in that. You know, <clears throat> I'm really excited there are more than 25 men who are uh, committed to this men's summit that we're doing Friday morning. We, we get together 6 o'clock in the morning on Friday. That's tough enough, right? But these guys are committed to being in the Word every single day during the week. And, you know, it is going to change their lives. And it is going to change their families. And it is going to change our church. And it is going to change our community. People getting in the word and building a deep and a strong inner life with Christ. There are women that meet in Bible studies here where they are challenged to be in the scripture every day. John has taken the college group and they are going through scripture. They're in a study where they are going into scripture every day. And this is going to transform people's lives. 
And if you are not doing that, if you're not involved in that, and you're not having that daily time with Christ, and you need some accountability, join one of those groups. It's a great thing to have some accountability, having somebody help you um, in your walk with God and in connecting with Him. Well, Paul moves on. He talks about the results of not building an inner life. And he says, if you do not build this inner life, then number one, your life will be destroyed. Your God will be your appetites. And you will be prideful and arrogant. You know, God created us as sensual beings. We experience our, all, all kinds of things through our senses. Our, but the problem is our desires, our senses, they can become controlling desires. What God gives us is a God-given desire can get supercharged and blown out of control. God gives us these great desires, right? Desire for beauty, for food, for art and music, for achievement, for meaning and significance, for relationship, for sexuality, for recreation. All of these are good God-given desires. And yet sin, Satan, comes along and supercharges these desires and twists them and they become controlling desires. And you all know this. You've all seen this. You've seen it in your life. You've seen it in the lives around you. And Paul says, it makes me cry. You know, guy goes to, goes to work and maybe things aren't really great with his wife at home and, and there's this gal at work and they start just this little flirtation, nothing, nothing big, nothing, um, nothing terrible or anything, just a little flirtation. It gives a little you know, spike in the day. And uh, then it's, he starts like, wanting to spend a little bit more time looking for uh, you know, an excuse to spend time and, and to talk with her. And there's some laughter and there's some, some chatter. And you know, you're so just wonderfully charming and whimsical. And, and, you know, and all of a sudden, there's a conversation that, that goes the wrong direction. There's inappropriate discussions. And then a marriage is blown out. And kids lose their home. And everybody cries. And you've seen it. You've seen that story. Uh, we all know stories. You know, somebody couldn't control sexuality and, and they were on the internet. And then there's a site that they're on. And there's... Um, you know, there's fantasy, and then there's addiction, and then there's just a deadness in their soul, and a loss of intimacy in their relationship. And the family cries. You know, people had a tough, uh, tough market, job market's difficult. Um, we have this need for achievement, you know? And this need for achievement gets supercharged. And you know, you know, you know how hard it is. I gotta go, I gotta drive, I gotta achieve, I gotta, I gotta get to this, you know, get to the next level. And um, this need for achievement just runs through and it destroys a partnership. It destroys a marriage, it destroys a life. And we all cry. You know, we have these needs, needs for power, for recognition. You know, look at just look at materialism. Um, in our culture, you know, you start to accumulate things and you accumulate a little more and a little bit more and then you start going into debt to accumulate even more and, and you accumulate all this stuff and you turn around and you find that you don't have stuff but the stuff has you. And it's become your God and it's crowded out everything else in your life and people around you cry. And Paul, just like you right now, Paul's thinking about real people that he knows that neglected to build their inner life. And these desires got supercharged in them and their God became their appetite. And they're on the road towards destruction and a wasted life. And you know the secret to controlling these desires is not to power up your self-will. You know, I'm just gonna be strong, I'm gonna do this thing, I'm gonna power through this, I'm gonna get it done. Because you are too weak and too broken and Satan is too strong and too clever and he will twist those desires and he will spin you around and he will play you for the fool. Timothy Keller said this, and I, I love this. He says, no one was ever deeply changed by an act of the will. And that again. No one was ever changed deeply by an act of the will. We don't decide that we're going to change. 
Keller goes on to say, we're changed by love. We're changed when we are loved, when we experience love. And that's what we're talking about. That it is this, the love of Christ in our life that changes us. It's not a to-do list. It's not a to-don't list. It's like a, not a checklist. It's things that we're not going to do. It's coming close. It's coming into a relationship with Christ, building that strong inner life, and drawing the power from him to overcome those controlling desires. Well, the third mark of somebody who has a spiritual recession is this. They forget their final destination. Paul says they think that this world is their one and only life. They forget that there's, there's life beyond this world. Um, and, you know, you know people who are just focused. And, the, you know, the busier we get and the less we connect with Christ, the more we're focused and we're thinking that this world is all that there is. Isn't that true? We all have experienced that. And you've seen it in other people. When I was a young Christian, I remember people used to have this phrase that, that somebody was so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You know, you heard that? And I fear for us that we get the other way that we are so earthly minded that we are no heavenly good. You want to know which side of the equation there you fall on? Pull out your checkbook. Pull out your calendar. You know, where's your money going? Where's your time going? Are you investing time in eternal things? Or is all of your time and all of your money being invested on stuff for today? Paul says they act as if this world was their one and only life. And it's not. And focusing on the glory to come changes our lives now. You know, 1 John uh, 3, 2 to 3 says this. Uh, it says, we know that when Christ comes, or when we're with Christ, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is, okay? So we know that that's coming in the future, right? Someday we'll stand in front before Christ and we'll get rid of these mortal bodies and we'll put on immortality and we will be like Christ because we see him just as he is. But John also goes on to say, and everyone who has this hope fixed upon him purifies himself just as he is pure. So focusing on an eternal perspective, on we will become like Christ, focusing on that eternal perspective will purify us today. So, conclusion. You want a spiritual recession? Cruise along. You know, come to church when it's convenient. Um, Leave and don't think, about, uh, don't think about God. Don't spend time with God. Don't be in his word. Uh, don't be challenged to take courageous steps of faith. Um, just cruise through, and you will experience a spiritual recession in 2012. If you don't build a powerful inner life, and again, spiritual maturity is not built in a day, but it is built daily. And if you don't do that, you will make people cry. You just will. Um, there's going to be a desire. There's going to be a controlling desire. There's going to be a twisting. And you're going to be overwhelmed. And you know what? We all know people that this has happened to. Better people than you and me. In fact, sometimes it helps me. Uh, you know, all, all of us know someone, right, who's had that control and desire twisted, and it's spun them and played them for a fool, and they have been destroyed. All that family members, people in our lives, friends, people that we know, where that's happened. I look at them, you know, better people than me, and they, they spun out and they blew out because they didn't build that daily walk with God. And you know what that does to me? It scares me. When I see this happen to a pastor, to a Christian leader, um, to somebody that I respect in my life, it scares me because I know 
that they're more mature than I am. I know that they're further along than I am. I know that they've given more for the cause of Christ than I have. And yet, they've been spun and played for a fool. And they've been, had at least that part of their life destroyed. And it scares me. And it drives me to scripture. And it tells me I have to be in God's word. I do not have the strength to do this. So how do you build this strong inner life? I want to get really practical here, okay? Uh, you know, we can, we can kind of you know, talk theory and motivation, pep talk and everything, but if, if we're not practical, if we don't get down to it, um, then you'll be like the one out of nine, maybe one person out of nine kind of changes their behavior a little bit, but most of you will just, you know, you remember sermons about uh, an hour, hour and a half, by the end of the Super Bowl, most of what we talked about this morning will be, will be gone um, from your mind. So I want to get practical and um, talk about how this works. And here's the keys. You need a regular time. You need a regular place. And you need a plan. What is your plan in 2012 for drawing close to Christ? How are you going to do it? Because it won't happen just by itself. It won't happen just by listening to a message on Sunday morning. It has to be something that you do. So if you don't have a plan, um, or your plan's not working for you, let me share with you mine. And I will be the first one to tell you that this is not inspired, but it is very helpful. And so here's what I do. And you actually have a picture of this on the back side of your, your sermon notes. Okay. And so hopefully this will help you and give you a little bit of a guideline. But here's what I do. I take a, a book like this. It just says journal on the front. Now, spiral notebook would work just as well, but I, I like these. So I get this journal. And what I do is I, when I spend my time with God, I just open it up. And over here on the left-hand side, at the top, I write the word yesterday. And you'll see that on your outline. Now, why do I do that? Well, what do NFL teams do on Monday? They watch game film, right? So this is the game film from yesterday. And so what I do, I write yesterday and I pray. And I ask God, God, show me the game film. Show me yesterday. Were there times, were there places where I was, I was short with people? I was irritated with people. Um, how, did I, how did I love my wife? How did I love my kids? What did I do? Was I, you know, was I a good example to my staff people uh, at work? Um, was I impatient? Uh, did, I, did I miss an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus' forgiveness with somebody in my, in my neighborhood or at work? What happened yesterday? And I just write, because if I just think and I don't write, whew, I'm just gone, right? I mean, whew, 20 minutes later, it's like, what, what, what did I, oh my gosh, I was thinking about the Super Bowl, and I was thinking about all, you know, whatever, I was thinking about all these different things, and I didn't go anywhere. With that. So I just write. I, I got to do this. So, so I write it all down, and as God just prompts me, I'm just writing. I'm just listening to him. I'm just trying to spend some time listening. And this is, this is a time of prayer here. And then down here, you've got the EPS, and you'll see that in your thing. Um, I just write the letter E, the letter P, the letter S, and the E stands for emotional. And what I do is I just rate myself on a you know, scale of 1 to 10. Where am I today emotionally? Uh, physical, P. Where am I physically? Am I, is my body wearing down? Am I doing good physically? Am I, am I, am I okay? Am I staying in shape? Is, have I been exercising recently? Um, and then S is for spiritual. How am I in my spiritual walk, my life with God? Um, and I just, it's, it's a really quick one. It's just one through 10, just evaluate each of those things. But um, the past, my first pastor, Joe Aldrich, was the pastor of the first church that I ever went to. And, um, he had this saying, he used to always say that the, uh, the body and the spirit are so interlinked that they catch each other's diseases. You know, I think that's really true. And so physically, how you are physically will affect how you are spiritually. How you are emotionally will affect how you are physically. And all these things are interlinked. So it's just a matter of being self-aware and kind of knowing where you stand and being able to lay that before God and being honest about that. And then on this side, I just write at the top, the scripture reference, whatever scripture I'm, I'm you know, spending time with that day, and I'll put the reference up there, and then I'll just jot some notes. I jot first observations, that's on your, on your list there, 
Any observations about the scripture? And then the interpretation, that's important, you know. Here's how it was 2,000 years ago in a fishing village in Galilee. How does that relate to today? How do I interpret that for my life today? How do I see that playing out today? And then application. Based on that, what is God saying to me? What am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do this week specifically to change? And so I write those things down, and then I pray. And at the end, at the bottom there, you'll see I just use this acronym, ACTS. A lot of you have seen that. It's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Supplication being we needed an S, right? So that's just asking God for stuff. Uh, but adoration is just you know what we did this morning. It's just praising God. Sometimes I just do that in song, and sometimes I do that... Uh, you know, uh, just, just talking to him. But uh, confession, I mean, that's a really important discipline every day. Why? Because one, it keeps us humble. And number two, it throws a cold bucket of water on those, um, those controlling desires to keep them from getting out of, out of control. And so then we just go through it. We, um, you know, thank, thank God for things and we ask God for our requests and, and I just bring that to him. And that whole thing takes about 20 minutes. Uh, sometimes I get a little carried away, sometimes I, I don't, but you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, um, got time with God. Um, and you know what's great is sometimes I go back to this, and in some of the dark times, in some of the times when my emotional, spiritual, and physical were in like the twos and threes, I'll go back and I'll read. And those are some of my richest times, you know, some of the things I was learning from God. And it's just great to have a, have a you know, have that documented, be able to go back to it for encouragement. But if I never looked at this again, it just helps focus my time on being with God. So if that helps you, like I say, I put that in the bulletin just so that you can kind of follow that little outline. Part of the plan as well is what do you do? How do you, where do you study? I mean, if you just flip open the scripture and just you know, close your eyes and stick your finger in there, um, it is just not going to work for you. You're just not going to get everything out of it. So there are all kinds of great devotionals that will lead you through the scriptures. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, but some of the ones that I've used, I kind of like this. Jan, I go through this every morning. Uh, it's called Jesus Calling. How many have seen this one? It's a pretty, yeah, it's a bestseller. It's a pretty popular book. Um, she just takes scripture and she interprets it. Um, she paraphrases it as though Jesus was saying whatever the scriptures to you. You know, and it's kind of neat, but she also lists the scriptures. And so, you know, I kind of go through the scriptures in here. And that, that's been helpful. If you just want a, an easy scripture guide to help you trust, that's good. Um, this is the Closer Walk New Testament. Uh, this is great. This will take you through the entire New Testament in a year. That's a great way to do it. Uh, John Stott has a, um, a devotional through the Bible through the year. This is wonderful. I've gone through this. It takes you through the whole Bible over the course of a year. And the men are now doing this. It's real-life discipleship, and this has got studies every single day that get you into the Word. Whatever it is, whatever you use, um, use something that gets you into the Word, that gets you into Scripture, and spend the time meditating on it. Allow it to change you. Um, just you know, to summarize everything, where, where we've been, the most important thing in 2012 for you to have a new beginning is to love Jesus, walk with Jesus, be with Jesus. You need to be in his word every day and to hear from him. You've got to spend time in prayer, and you've got to hear him ask you to take courageous steps of faith. Number two, the second thing is if you do that, you will build the strength that you need to break the power of worldly passions. In 2012, sin is going to come at you fast and hard. It just is. And if you are not ready, it is going to twist you, spin you around, and play you like a fool and your life will be destroyed. So you need to build a powerful inner life. Third, remember where you're headed. This world is not our home. We are not, we do not believe that our hope is in this world. We do not live for this world. There's a great hymn that says this. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The opposite is also true. If you do not turn your eyes on Jesus, if you do not look full in his wonderful face, the things of earth will not become dim. They will become crystal clear, and they will become enticing, and they will draw you away, 
and they will take you down. So that's how to have a spiritual renewal. Every day you make a choice. I don't know what's coming for you, but I know this. In 2012, if you will follow Jesus, if you will walk with him daily, if you will connect with him on a daily basis, 2012 will be a great year for you. And if you don't, you're going to make us all cry. Well, we don't want that. Father, I pray that your word would not come back void. Lord, that you would take these things that we've learned in your word, that you would change us daily. Lord, we cannot become changed all at once. It is always a daily process. And so we pray that you would make that clear to us. Change us from the inside out, Lord, that we might be like you. In Christ's name, amen.